Our second reading comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 to 12. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of all of you, ha- and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. Father, may you meet us where we are, and we pray that you would uh, unstop our ears and soften our hearts, that we may receive the word that you have for us this morning. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we start a four-week series through 2 Thessalonians. And I believe it's, it's a good message for us. The, the, writer, um, the letter writer Paul, as he was writing to this church, you know, I believe that just as they were going through things, it is pretty apt for the things that we are also going through and can go through and maybe will go through here in North America as well. So buckle in, and for the next four weeks, we're going to check out this letter to the second, uh, to Thessalonians. So this is the second letter here. Suffering is what Paul was talking about here in this first chapter, if you caught wind of that as you were following along. Suffering is not something that we want to hear about, nor do we want to experience it. I mean, that's normal. None of us want to do that. And it's not easy to preach on because it is a sensitive subject. And to be honest, to this point in my life, I haven't really suffered. You know, I've had things pretty good. I don't want it to be a sermon that is lean on reality and fatty on empty platitudes, but something that is real, and I really want it to be truly nourishing for you. However, we do need to know more about a theology of suffering. Here in our day and age, all we want to do is feel good. And we want things to happen on our time at the snap of a fingers. We want it done for us. And so we've twisted God in this way. We've twisted our faith in this way. And so when we hit a bump in the road or when things happen to us, you know, it can severely rock the foundations of our faith because those foundations were rocky to begin with. It was just all sand. And yet what we see in the Bible over and over again in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is a theology of suffering, a healthy theology of suffering, especially as it pertains to faith. So not suffering because you deserve it, not suffering because you stepped into it in our sinfulness, in, in, uh, you know, out of anger, out of, uh, you know, out of just uh, uh, impulsiveness, but as it pertains to faith specifically. For those of us going through suffering for our faith, in this moment, this message matters. And as a means of preparing us for when it may happen to us, this message matters. In our day and age, there is so much that the culture is pushing against what the message of the church is. And so we have to remain steadfast. And I don't mean to push our message and to say it in a way where it you know, rubs people the wrong way and we do that purposefully. I don't mean like that. But there are things that we stand to, stand for. 
as we stand on Scripture, as we stand on the Gospel, these things. And so there may be a time where it is coming down the way, it's coming down the road, where we will have to, the rubber will hit the road, will we be steadfast? Now here in North America, we do and we can suffer for our faith to an extent. Now what that looks like is it's not so physical as much as it is a lot to do mentally, and that's troubling as well. Here in North America, we do and can suffer for our faith around people, what people think about us. It, we, take a, we take a hit to our reputation. People gossip about us, and that could lead to more serious issues around our mental health. I mean, that is a real thing. Our faith may also cost us in how we're able to take care of our families, how we're able to take care of ourselves with a hit against our income. And so the question arises, why would God allow this to happen in His sovereignty, in His purpose, in his plan for us, why do we suffer? Why do followers of Christ suffer for following Jesus Christ? And I think the first thing to do is to look at this from another angle, another spiritual reality that is very real and just as relevant is that we are worthy to suffer for Christ. It's not just happening to us, but it's something because we're steadfast, because we're faithful, because we know and have experienced the love of God and we know Him in His beauty, that He is worth it, that we are worthy to suffer for Him. And we are being made more worthy to suffer for Christ as we enter into deeper discipleship, as we follow Jesus more deeply and and entrust our lives to Him as we come against things that are going against the grain of what our faith and what the Holy Spirit is telling us in our hearts, then we may be made worthy to suffer for Christ in a fuller way. There are four elements that play an important role in having a theological framework on suffering. So if we were taking a look at this theological framework on suffering, this is what it looks like. Here are the four elements of what it looks like to have a theological framework, a theological understanding of what what it looks like to suffer for Jesus. And it's this, the first element is having a sense of God's retributive justice. Just vengeance is the Lord, is the Lord's. It's not a vengeance that is uh, impulsive. It's not impetuous. It's not, uh, uh, it's not just on a whim, but it is based on God's holiness. It is based on God's justice. So that is the first element, having a sense of God's retributive justice. The second element is this. The present suffering of the faithful is shaping them to be worthy of future go- glory. The present suffering of the faithful is shaping them even further to be worthy of future glory. This third element is this, there will be a future judgment and justice meted out against the present untroubled, godless people, a complete reversal to what the faithful will experience in that future time. And the fourth element is this, the present suffering of the Lord's chosen ones is actually evidence of God's election and God's justice. So if you read, <coughs> excuse me, if you read other passages about suffering for Jesus Christ, you can lay them in this framework and you will see that there is this theology of suffering that we see throughout Scripture and that's what we see here. This passage fits extraordinarily well into this framework. Verses 6 and 8 point to God's just retribution. People will get what they deserve. Those who are afflicting the faithful will themselves be afflicted in the time to come. In verse 5, Paul aimed the Thessalonian believers to the purpose of their suffering. It was to shape them to be even more worthy of their coming future blessing in God's kingdom. (coughs) That's according to element number two. So the present suffering of the faithful is shaping them to be worthy of future glory. Verse five points to that. Verse six points to the future judgment and justed meted out against those that deserve it. 
It points to the just reversal. People will get what they deserve, whereas God's faithful elect, they will have whatever they're going through will completely reverse 180, 180 degrees, and they will get to experience His grace and His mercy in a very real way. The fourth element, the fourth one is the present suffering of the Lord's chosen ones is evidence of God's election and justice. This is what verse 3 is talking about. What follows in verse 3 and what and following is the evidence that their suffering had, has had the intended consequences. As they have suffered, it's actually honed them and it's actually formed them in the crucible and so they are becoming even more faithful even more deeper in their discipleship, even more loving of their fellow church members, of their fellow body, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And all these things are deepening together, and it has these intended consequences. They're being honed. They're even more worthy of, God, of being God's kingdom citizens. They have already grown in faith and in love. And so we see this interplay here in this passage today is that here is this theology of suffering that when we suffer for our faith it is according to god's purposes paul was encouraging the thessalonians he's comforting the thessalonians why their suffering was purposeful god was using it to continue to shape them God was going to work out His righteous justice and God would use them and glory would abound. Here are these three points that we see in this passage. And so what we see here is this big idea that suffering for our faith is full of God's purpose. It's not just uh, empty. It's not just something that kind of just coincidentally happens to us. No, it is full of purpose full for us to shape us, but also full for us to experience God's glory, Christ's glory in that time to come. And we are also comforted with this message that what is happening to us and the hardships that we go through right here, right now, God sees, God cares, and God will take care of it. Now, what I want us to do is we're going to go through the text presented and we're going to trace Paul's thought in his thought process. And again, so Paul, here we are in this second letter to the Thessalonians. In his first letter to the Thessalon- uh, Thessalonican church, uh, in that first letter, Paul had commended them on their faithfulness already. He was really, really uh, happy with this church. He used familial terms, brothers and sisters, like right off the bat. And if you do a quick comparison with his other letters, he doesn't start calling those other churches brothers and sisters until later on, but this is like almost immediately. He says his greetings, grace and peace to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies who he is, I, Paul, and and so and so, I'm writing to you, right? And then he gives his thanksgiving for them. these These are elements of letter writing in that time. But then right after that, for Paul, he's like, ah, I'm so thankful for you, Thessalonian church, my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, here is a town, well, not a town, it was a city on a port. It was the gateway into Macedonia. And so very multicultural, lots and lots of activity happening there, lots of commerce, a whole hodgepodge of people, just like Toronto here. You know, we are considered to have one of the most multicultural cities in the world. When I lived in Chicago, I remember that Chicago was also considered this as well, but I didn't experience it like I experienced it here. You know, here, you know, you will see so many different people in the neighborhoods, on the streets, and that was the way that I imagined. That's kind of like what Thessalonica was. Port town, bustling, lots of different people, lots of different ideas, lots of different religions. You know, and then now here is this band of believers that's being built up, that is turned to Jesus Christ. Their lives are being transformed, and now they're saying things like, Jesus is the only way. It rubs people the wrong way. And perhaps they were employed, and now they're starting to say these things, or perhaps their employers have also been asking of them, we want you to do X, Y, and Z, and, and now coming 
face to face with Jesus Christ and having their lives transformed by the Holy Spirit, they realize, I can't do that anymore. You know, all these things were working against this church, and Paul is so proud of them. He says, you know what? We boast about you to the other churches. You have grown in these ways. Here are these three reasons. I'm so thankful for you. Your faith is is continuing to grow. It's growing abundantly. It's not just a weak faith, but it is a faith that is just growing and growing. He says this about them as well. Here's a second reason he's so thankful for them. Your love for each other continues to increase. At the time like that, a time when they're being crushed by all this pressure, by all this persecution, it would be very easy to become divided very easy to maybe point the finger. But instead, their love was increasing. Not only that, but they were also steadfast, Paul says. This is in verses 3 and 4. They were also steadfast. They were filled with faith. They were persevering. They were enduring in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the affliction. Again, we would understand if they turtled We would understand if they curled up and said, you know, no more. But that's not what happened. In the churches that we see throughout the New Testament, we we see this. Last fall when we went through 1 Peter, if you read that, here's another church, suffering for their faith. Peter is commending them. Keep it up, keep going, remain steadfast. You know, it is also something we're going through in this time too. It would be so easy to capitulate. I was just part of a, a webinar on Zoom where um, it was for Alpha, actually, and they're giving some of the statistical breakdown from 2,700 of churches across Canada. 2,700, so that's pretty good. And it was shocking to hear how we have abdicated our mission, our responsibility to tell people about the gospel. Like, there was some statistic, I'll give you the exact numbers if you, uh, uh, next week, or I'll actually post them on Facebook, but there is a high percentage of people who don't feel like we should be telling people about Jesus Christ. There are a number of people, like a high percentage of people that don't believe that we should be telling people of other faiths that they should come to know Jesus Christ. And we can understand that here in this multicultural city, just like Thessalonica. We can understand that. We can understand that pressure. You know, it's not popular. We don't want to impose our faith on people. And that's not, I'm not saying to do it in a way where we're just cramming it, where we're trying to strong arm it. But surely the the mandate, the mission that we're given, go and make disciples You know, we have the model of it in the New Testament. The church is exploding. People from all sorts of different faiths are coming to know Jesus Christ. They have all sorts of different gods, and yet the message was going out, and people were being told about the beauty and the worth of this one and only God, and that they could experience the grace and love through Jesus Christ, through His sacrifice on the cross. And so we can definitely identify with that feeling. And yet Paul is saying to this Thessalonican church, you're doing it, keep going. You're abounding in love, you're steadfast, ah, keep going, I give thanks for you. And so we have this pretty great picture, faithful, growing disciples in the midst of this real adversity, in real persecution, in real affliction, and how they lived it out. And then Paul says this very unexpected comment about their suffering. We get back to this this question. We get back to this main idea that he's getting at. Suffering for our faith is full of God's purposes. It was evidence, their suffering was evidence of the righteous judgment of God. And when we hear that, we're like, how does that make sense? So I'm suffering because God wants me to? That's God's righteous judgment? And what Paul was giving them an inside glimpse of to to give them another angle of how to see their suffering was to say, this is evidence already that God has formed you 
in the midst of this suffering, God is continuing to form you. And here is what is going on with this, that God is using it in His specific purposes for His reasons, and He is shaping you, and He's doing these things in you and through you. It was because they were worthy of the kingdom of God that they were suffering, and their suffering was continuing to shape who they were. We see this all over the New Testament. Paul wrote about it in 2 Corinthians chapter, two, uh, chapter 12, verse 10. He said, you know, I'm content to have insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities in my life for the sake of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 3, Paul was teaching, rejoice in your suffering. We read it in Acts, Luke he records this in the history of the church. He says this in Acts chapter 5 in, this, uh, in one of the, um, uh, the narratives of the early church. He says the apostles were arrested. They were hassled, thrown in prison. But they left prison rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. You know, that's for the name of Jesus. Not only was it Paul and Luke, but also Peter wrote about the suffering for faith in Christ. It's evidence of their true faith. It is evidence of their faith. What, is, what are we seeing here? What we're seeing here is that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. That even when we go through all, this, all these hard times because of our faith, you link the hard time because of your faith in Jesus Christ that He is worth it. You know, people are pushing against the church and right now we've shot ourselves in the foot a lot of times too, let's be honest. There's some good reasons over certain issues. But what has been argued even by Christian and non-Christian sociologists is how much effect the Christian faith has had for good in the world. Christian ethics reshaped the world to be a more humane place because of the way that Scripture teaches us to view humanity, the higher ethic of love, the higher ethic of service. We are worthy to suffer for our faith. Suffering for our faith is full of God's purposes. And we take comfort in knowing this, that God will exercise His justice on those who afflict. Paul was comforting these Thessalonian believers in verses 6 to 9. Their suffering was evidence of their true faith, just as Paul was writing, but that was not to say that the Lord didn't see or didn't care. But the Lord's justice will prevail. It will prevail. It's just like the just deliverer that we see in the Psalms. You read throughout the Psalms, the writer of the Psalms writing, Lord, deliver me. Don't you see what these enemies are doing to me? Turn back upon them what they are doing to me. And you see it written through the Psalms as these honest Psalm writers are just asking for God to be just, to be holy, and it's the same thing here. And it's the same principle that we see in the prophets as well. Vengeance is God's and he will repay. That's what we heard read in Isaiah 35, that God will turn on their heads what they deserve. It's not right in this moment, but at the end of time when Jesus ultimate judgment comes, all will be made right. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets and writers said, when the day of the Lord comes, when that day comes, everything will be made right. There will be righteous judgment. And when we hear that word judgment, it can sometimes create a little bit of fear because we think, oh, God's going to crush me because I'm just so unworthy. But in the Old Testament, it was something to look forward to because it was to say, God, you are righteous, you are holy, and you have seen all the unrighteousness, all the terrible things that have happened to us, and you will switch it around because you have our backs. You are just. And this is the same thing that Paul is saying here. God is the one. Vengeance is his. 
those who are afflicted will themselves, uh, those who afflict will themselves be afflicted. This is what Paul's getting at in verse 7. And those who are afflicted will receive sweet relief in that day to come. They will experience all of God's grace, all His mercy. Paul described that day to come as Jesus being revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in this flaming fire of judgment. In righteous judgment, it will be no mistaking God's power and glory and His might in that day. Now, although we don't want to wish eternal separation from God on anyone, you know, what did Jesus himself say? You know, love your enemies. It's easy to love your loved ones, love, your, like, love people who are lovable, but what did Jesus say? What did, what did Jesus challenge us on? Love your enemies as well. And we don't want to wish eternal separation from God on anyone, but this focus is on God's justice those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. In verse 9, what Paul wrote here, they will sadly face what we all actually deserve apart from Jesus Christ. I want us to catch that. We all deserve God's wrath. We're all under, we were all under the dominion of sin, under sin's power but it is the grace of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross that has set us free. Think about the high price that was paid. The Son of God, God the Son, Jesus Christ came down and allowed himself to be nailed to the cross purposefully. That is a high, high cost for a high, high cost. Uh, just the most terrible thing for sin, for the power of sin, to break it, it took the most, it, it took the highest cost. They will not get to experience the positive side of the glory of Christ's might, of Christ's power, but it will be turned on them. Paul's use of the idea where he says they will face eternal destruction was to highlight just how devastating and significant the Lord's righteous judgment will be. This is the severity of the punishment for those who do not, who do not obey, for those who will not accept Christ from the witness and proclamation of this church. They're living it out, they're speaking it out, and yet they will not receive. And so although we don't want it, And yet we take comfort that God sees, God knows what's happening. And all those unfair things that you may be experiencing right now, perhaps you are suffering for your faith. And I know some people in this church are. You know, know this, be comforted in this, God sees and cares. In that day, on the day of God's judgment, God will be glorified and we too will be glorified in him. God will be glorified. Jesus will be glorified in those who remain steadfast, those who truly believe. It was his grace alone that allowed faithful ones to continue on. It's his grace alone that that strengthens us to continue on. In Jude, it says, now to him who is able to present you pure and blameless. It is, it is Christ's power is the one that transforms us and the one that is able to set us up in that way, set us up and allow us to remain steadfast. And our faithfulness, as it comes from Christ's strength, it also brings Jesus greater glory. His coming will be a marvel. It will be a celebration. It will be full of unspeakable joy for us who believe. And his coming is the culmination of our faith. And so suffering in this lifetime, suffering for our faith is full of God's purpose. He hones us. He shapes us. It is the evidence that we are worthy of it. It is the evidence that we have been so faithful. And it is also our privilege to suffer for Jesus 
And we also will get to experience God's full glory. We will get to bask in the glory of Jesus Christ on that day. What does suffering for our faith look like? And I think at this point we have to be careful and discerning. You know, a couple of examples Paul gave is that suffering for our faith and enduring should be leading to deeper growth. In verses 3 and 4, our faith should also be growing abundantly. And it should be leading to a deeper love. It should lead to a love that is increasing. This is the evidence of it. And if what we believe, if what we believe is suffering for our faith is leading to greater anger and less love, then are we suffering with the right attitude? And are we truly suffering for our faith? And if it is leading to greater divisiveness, are we suffering rightly? As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, we rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So are we enduring in the face of our suffering? Are we being transformed by the Holy Spirit even more to produce Christ-like character? Do we have more hope? Do we have more love? Now, my hope and prayer is the Spirit is cultivating these same core character traits that he was shaping in the Thessalonian church that Paul had identified. And I hope that the Lord also transforms us and sees us exercising these same traits of endurance, of faithfulness, greater love and obedience to Christ, greater love for one another during this time as well. This divisive moment requires a steadfastness, a steadiness in the light of all our uneven footing. There's been so much that has been thrown our way to trip us up. It requires a growing faith in one that is not stagnant. It requires a love for one another that is fulsome and that we are exercising. Just as Paul had listened, listed in 1 Corinthians 13, we use 1 Corinthians all the time, 13, chapter 13, the love chapter. It's a great chapter for weddings and, and things like that. And, but it was really about the unity of the church. Love is patient. Love is kind. Spousal love, that's great, but really between brothers and sisters in Christ, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not arrogant. And my goodness, we're seeing this right now. Instead, we need to be coming together in humility. Paul got his idea across just how holy our action-oriented, unconditional love is supposed to be towards one another, especially in difficult times like this. And Paul ended in a word of prayer in verses 11 and 12, and I, I pray that this prayer might also become our prayer. So let's pray together now. Make us worthy of your calling, Lord. You died on the gruesome cross for us. That's how great the power and dominion of sin is, that it took the greatest sacrifice to break our bondage, to make us free to be in right relationship with you. And that's what our worth is also to you, that you love us so much that you would die for us. It is worth our short-term suffering for our faith in this short lifetime. Lord, fulfill in us and through us the work of faith you want us to carry out. Fill us with your power to do this, because we cannot. May you be glorified in us, and we look forward to that day of being glorified in you. We are so grateful for your grace, your lavish love that you enact towards us, Lord, even though we are so unworthy and we fall so far short of it. We partake in the grace that is offered through your Son, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue in worship by responding uh, with our givings. Uh, the giving